Hi, hello everyone. So I'm really very pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me this evening. And um, I'm going to share a bit of my story with you, uh, which has been a bit of a roller coaster ride over the last uh, too many years now. I really remember sort of back in the 90s always being the young one in the room. And I suddenly realized the other day that shit. I am not anymore the young one in the room. That's now I'm, you know. <laughs> Which is a bit of a bloody surprise, quite frankly, because, you know, life goes by. But anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey um, over the last 20 years. Um, I've been running digital businesses since 1995. Um, and I thought maybe I'd tell you a little bit about how I got into that, what's ended up becoming a real passion for me. And, um, and I'll share with you a few of the, the sort of triumphs and uh, tribulations along the way. Th this is a picture of me with my now business partner, Kate Shapland, who's probably the most renowned beauty editor and expert in the UK. Uh, we are standing in my kitchen here because my current business is my showcase, which is the easiest way for you guys to think about it is probably Avon meets Space NK completely enabled by technology. But we'll come back to that a bit later. I'll tell you a little bit about the business later, really just to, to illustrate a few points. Am I going to drive you crazy, by the way, if I move a lot? No. Okay, good. So I started out life uh, working for Condé Nast. Uh, I mean, these guys, you know, Cindy and Linda and Naomi, they, they were the supermodels when I started working at, uh, at Vogue. This was one of the first covers, actually, that I was involved with. And I was really pretty jammy coming out of university. And it, I, I learned a really important lesson as soon as I began my career, which was I had grown up with a father who worked in the beauty industry. He worked for Revlon and traveled all over the world. So I grew up between Hong Kong, London, and New York. And um, he had introduced me to someone who he didn't really know, who ran another beauty business here in the UK. He didn't really know the UK market by the time I was ready to try and find a job. And this very kind woman who worked for Calvin Klein at the time said, Nancy, if you ever need any introductions to you know, anyone in London, I'd said I was interested in the magazine scene, then um, let me know and uh, I'll write a few letters for you. And I remember after this uh, drinks party thinking, oh, a nice offer base, one of those things that people say. And you know, six months later, I was graduating from Leeds and I thought, you know what, actually, how am I going to get in to, to, to work at one of these magazines? I've been obsessed with uh, magazines like Vogue and Cosmo since I was probably about 15, 16. And I, I called this woman up important lesson the phone is still very valuable guys by the way you know email text is not in fact the be all and end all in getting stuff done in business but I called this woman Teresa up and said listen how about it you know would you still be willing to introduce me to some of these magazine publishers I'd really love to you know figure out what that's all about and she she wrote about a dozen letters and every single one of the publishing directors from you know Vogue to Good Housekeeping Cosmo all met me None of them were going to give me a job. I was purely opportunistic at the time. And I managed to go see Stephen Quinn, uh, who is the then and now publishing director of Vogue. And I remember walking into his office. My maiden name was Martin. He said, Miss Martin, I've got 10 minutes, so ask your questions quickly. And, um, and actually, I spent an hour and a half with him. In fact, he took me for lunch at the back of Vogue House. And at the end of it, he offered me a job as their marketing manager. They'd never had one of those before. But obviously, somehow, we'd struck a chord. And it was a really important lesson at the very, very start of my career around you have to seize opportunities. And you have to see you know, what can come of that. And in actual fact, it sounded incredibly glamorous. I mean, everybody at the time who worked at Condé Nast at Vogue, well, in fact, everyone really needed a trust fund to afford to work there. I certainly did not have one of those. So I had to work really bloody hard to try and get noticed. Um, and although the job sounded quite glamorous, being the marketing manager of Vogue, what it really meant was that I spent a couple of hours planning about £250,000 worth of ads in the evening standard. It only did take a couple of hours to plan the whole year's sort of campaign. And then the rest of the time, I worked in the research department, plugging away at kind of TGI data to try and understand, you know, how many readers reading Vogue actually also consume Chanel or Marks and Spencers. Or this was the start of the 90s. So quite frankly, you know, how many people also needed a NatWest banking account? Because you know what? We were going to have to go and flog stuff to those guys as well. We were not purely going to get, you know, a dozen pages of Ralph Lauren in the magazine every month in a tough market. So it was a great opportunity, but it was also a really great grounding in 
sort of working pretty hard and finding alternative ways to do business. And, um, and I think it set me up in a really good way, actually, to be able to, to, to navigate a sometimes unusual course. And I figured out probably after, I don't know, I guess 18 months or so of working on Vogue, which, you know, is a power brand. You know, you can phone anyone up and ask to talk about Vogue. People want to talk to you about it. But I figured out that you either had to write something or sell something. You know, being this kind of marketing person in the publishing world was not going to take me anywhere at all. And seeing as I couldn't write terribly well, I thought I'd better figure out how to, how to actually sell something, sell all of these things I was writing research and presentations about. So I went to work on another magazine called The World of Interiors, where I was the ad manager. And I basically had the, the greatest fun for a year and a half, kind of tripping around the world. Uh, representing all of the magazines at Condé Nast, actually Vogue, GQ, Interiors, and selling, selling advertising to luxury goods advertisers. This is the most upmarket magazine in the world, but was kind of like a little trade title, you know, rug sort of manufacturers and lovely uh, sort of fabric people and so on were advertising. And, and again, it was another way of just finding a, an unusual way of doing business, and, and we did very, very well. And I was having great fun doing that, actually. I was, you know, I guess I was 24, 25, and, uh, you know, you arrived from Condé Nast, you know, by yourself in Singapore, Hong Kong, luxury five-star hotel. You're immediately taken to the penthouse because they think you might be the editor. You're not, of course, the editor. And it was amazing, this trip. And it got to the end of 95, and Nick Kohlerich, who is the managing director of Condé Nast now, he was then as well, um, called me to his office oh shit, you know, some, something bad's gone wrong on one of these trips. But he called me up and he said, look, Nancy, I think we're going to do this thing called Condé Nast World Communicator. And I think we'd quite like you to run it. And I genuinely didn't understand what he'd said to me. I sort of sat across his desk and I thought, oh, I, I think he may have just asked if I would work on reception, you know, because it was communicator, you know, something. I, I genuinely didn't actually understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, at that time, I had seen the internet once, over someone's shoulder. And um, there, was, uh, there was a guy in the US called Nick Negroponte that was writing for Wired magazine. That seemed to be quite interesting. You know, I was reading this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I'd seen, I think I'd seen the, the Yahoo US site over someone's shoulder once. You know, these, we're talking like nine, six modems. I mean, at Condé Nast at Vogue House, we, we had had computers on our desks at this point for about four months. And it was incredibly stereotypical. I mean, at the time, there were about 400 people working in the business, of which there were 378 women and then about 22 guys. The 22 guys were either the bosses working in the mailroom or working in the IT department. And um, the guys from the IT department would come around and see us, you know, in editorial and advertising, and they would say, in such a patronizing way, hey, ladies, how's it going with the computers? <laughs> And uh, I was always very happy that I sat in the corner of the room in the ad department because I never had my computer on. But I was the last one that they were going to come and see. So I had time to be scrabbling under the desk, you know, which button do I press, kicking things, you know, with my shoes. And I'd, I'd pretty much have got this thing fired up by the time they came around. And, I mean, this thing was my whole desk. The depth of, you know, the computer, it, it was massive. You know, I, I was still sending telexes and faxes um, to all the clients I was dealing with around the world. But, um, but I'd fire this thing up and the guys from the IT department would say things like, you know, so how, how, how th how's the emailing going? And I'd be desperately clicking on this, you know, email icon. And I wouldn't have gone in for 10 days or more. And of course, I'd open it up and no emails, you know, nothing. <laughs> so I was like, great, it's going really well, it's brilliant. So, uh, so when I was asked to, to launch what ended up being you know, oh God, it didn't look like this. This is, you know, Vogue.com today or yesterday when I took the screen grab. Because um, it was a different time. I mean, none of that existed over here. And, and it, this was my world, but pretty much like this. Nine, six modems. I mean, there was no Safari. There was no Chrome, no Internet Explorer. There was Netscape 1. And it didn't support graphics. And I was, had the task of launching Vogue and GQ onto the internet, and I thought, well, it's all about art direction, so how are we going to tackle that? So 
I was uh, stupid and perhaps a little arrogant at the time, and so I, I built a browser at Condé Nast, which wasn't a fabulous user experience, I will fess up to now. It took 25 minutes to download, not once, but every time you visited the website. <laughs> um, so, you know, <laughs> we would laugh, actually, when I'd go to Nick's office on a Friday to talk about how many people had looked at Vogue that week, and I'd sort of go in and he'd say, so how's it going? And I'd say, well, it's better this week than last week. You know, we've doubled our numbers. So he'd say, well, how many? And I'd say, well, seven. <laughs> and he'd say, well, 7,000. And I was like, no, seven. <laughs> seven people looked at the website this week. And, uh, you know, it was madness. Nick would then get on the phone to uh, the press and talk to Media Week and campaign, and he'd be quite liberal with the numbers, in actual fact. But, you know, no one really cared at the time. It was growing. It was exciting. But it was really interesting days, you know, learning about how to, how to launch something. And I, I really, I guess I developed a real passion for technology then. I developed a real passion for understanding that you needed to really look at what the consumer wanted. I mean, it only took me, thank God, a week or two to figure out that a 25-minute download every time you came to the site was not in fact, what everyone has been waiting for. Um, but what they have been waiting for were things like Vogue Daily. You know, so we hired really smart students from Central St. Martins. And I said to them, you know what, you guys have to arrive at 7 in the morning every day. I know no one else arrives till 10, but you guys arrive at 7. We'll get the Wall Street Journal, the FT, whatever else it is, you know, on your desk, you know, drapers. And we will create Vogue-like content every day. And we'll start just, you know, making that available on the site. We'll start emailing it to people. And, and suddenly, you know, things started going. And, and thankfully, you know, the users started coming in there, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, um, getting towards a million. And um, it, was, it was a really interesting time. And it was incredibly maverick. It was working on a power brand. But it kind of, I think, was the thing that whetted my appetite around creating something from scratch. And I think that when people ask me to talk about uh, entrepreneurialism, you know, can I come and talk as a serial entrepreneur? It always slightly makes my toes curl. I think, oh, God, it sounds like I'm a serial killer or something. <laughs> something somehow slightly mad. Um, but I think there is a piece around it which is about a comfort with creation from scratch. And I think that there's something quite different, because I've spent a bunch of time sitting in corporate environments as the digital lead or as the board advisor or whatever it is. And, and I think the thing that really is very different um, that you, you must feel comfortable about if you're going to be an entrepreneur and create a business is you've got to create from nothing. You've got a blank sheet of paper. You've just got a piece of insight, an idea. You're looking at a market. You can see an opportunity. There's so many different triggers. And we'll talk a bit more about some of those. But I mean, I've, the business I'm working on now is my third business. And I've created a lot of others for other people. And I think the thing that always makes me feel somehow quite bold is, uh, as an entrepreneur, I don't know if the entrepreneurs in the room will agree with this, but the, the thing that happens to you all day, every day, is you, know, you breeze into a room and people say, how's it going? And uh, you, know, you have to apply a big smile to your face and say, great, fantastic. <laughs> and actually what you're thinking is, it's completely shit. You would not believe the crap I have dealt with today. And I feel like I've just gone about five steps backward. But there was one little glimmer over here of something that was quite interesting. You know, it's really bloody hard work in the first couple of years of any business. And, um, and you have to kind of be able to manufacture answers to questions that you just don't know about yet. And so I always know that a business is going quite well when you're able to answer people's questions um, with a real fluidity. Somehow, you don't really have to think. You don't even have to pause for a second to think about what the answer is. You just suddenly realize that, well, my husband would say, the bullshit comes even faster, Nancy. You know, it just <laughs> happens like that. And, um, <laughs> and I think there is a certain truth to that. There's something about creating from scratch. But we certainly had some fun doing that at Vogue. Um, when I, uh, wh whilst I worked at Vogue, um, I very naively had signed up to creating a break-even business in year one. I mean, I, I actually didn't know anything about running a business at all. And the reason I did it is because I, I absolutely can't tell you I had any vision for technology or the internet. I, I really didn't. I was just 25, really ambitious. I wanted to work for, for Nick. I really wanted to run Vogue, actually. But thank God I didn't wait for that, because the guy is still there running it today. 
But I wanted to work for Nick. I wanted to work a P and run a PL, although I genuinely didn't know what one was. And I had one awful day where I walked into the finance department um, very confidently and very businesslike, and I said, I would like to collect my PO today. <laughs> and uh, the finance director said to me, Nancy, I think you'll find that's a cruise ship, but you might like to have your PL, which is your profit and loss account. And um, <laughs> And so, you know, there, there was some great fun in all of that, you know, learning about those things. But because I'd signed up to a break-even business in year one, it, I only had to come up with half a million quid. But I realized that that was going to be really hard because, I mean, I had access through Nick and through my previous contacts to all of the advertisers I wanted to talk to. But I had 36 meetings with Estee Lauder from the CEO, Per Neumann, through to practically, you know, every individual working in the business. And they gave me £7,000 to spend on advertising. And I thought, geez, this is going to be you know, an absolute disaster. £500,000 suddenly seems like the most massive amount of money I've ever thought about. So we did things like we built, um, well, we built the Burton Group website, um, big retail website. It was purely brochureware at the time. We couldn't deal with e-commerce at all. This is before kind of Debenhams was dislocated from the group and it became Arcadia and so on. And actually, one great thing uh, that happened there was I really got to know Stuart Rose very well because I used to have to show up at his office every Friday, lunchtime. Sometimes he'd take me out for lunch and, and we'd have to go through the Excel spreadsheet looking at exactly how many people had looked at Evans that week and had looked at Topshop and Top Man and all these things that we'd been building. And, and normally it was a, a small handful looking at those things at the time. But we created lots of different things and we created quite a lot of programming for Microsoft that was genuinely just too early. I mean, you needed broadband to see this stuff. But we created sort of shows. And the guy who'd been running Microsoft had gone to work for Liz Murdoch at Sky. And um, they needed someone to run their tech channel. Um, it was called Dot TV. And uh, seemed to be quite an exciting proposition. You know, it really was going to be the, the kind of spokespiece for, you know, the booming digital economy. So I went to Sky to run a TV station. And I went there in the month that they were launching Sky Digital. And it was quite a cool place to work, actually, for a couple of years. And I probably would have stayed for a lot longer if I hadn't got swept up in launching my first business. But um, I worked for Liz, and I ran this station called .TV. It's a fully Sky-owned channel. It was the only channel that wasn't branded Sky. But we got to do some quite cool things with quite an eclectic mix of people, as you can see on the screen. I mean, we, we made loads of TV, and, and I definitely learned something here about transferable skills. I, mean, I didn't know anything about television. I, I had never produced any television, and suddenly I was running the Sky Station that produced more original content than pretty much any other station in the UK. I suddenly had two production studios, Capital Studios in Wandsworth, and then was working with a partner, Illumina, in Acton. And we couldn't buy tech programming because it didn't exist. There was no CNET, ZDTV, Ziff Davis. It just wasn't there. So we made stuff. And we made mad stuff. I mean, we made some quite sensible stuff. This is Kate Russell here um, doing a show called Chips With Everything, where, I mean, you, it was really properly geeky. And I used to have to tour around the country and go and see some quite dodgy men in focus groups, actually, who <laughs> were wanting to know all sorts of interesting things. And uh, they looked like they never really got dressed properly, actually. <laughs> Um, but, you know, writing to CD, my God, you know, suddenly we were filming this kind of stuff. How does one do that? And, you know, talking about all of that. But we did lots of other cool things. I got the first TV interview with Bill Gates um, that he'd given for seven years um, when he was writing his book, Business at the Speed of Thought. And that was kind of cool. We took a crew out to their campus in Seattle and spent um, a week, you know, really understanding. And it, and it felt really pretty cool and interesting and, and futuristic. Kind of weird that he sounded like Kermit the Frog, but you know it was, <laughs> it was very cool. And you know we did mad stuff. Like I mean, Brian Blessed created a game show with us called Nexus Lexus, and suddenly my days were very different. I'd spend my whole time kind of calming down directors who had been sworn at all day by Brian. I mean, seriously sworn at. You know, seriously bad words sworn at. But a real character, and actually a real sort of, I guess, Stephen Fry-like character in terms of he absolutely embraced this wave of, you know, digital things that were new. He used to love coming into the office and doing web chats. Um, and he had this very informal conversational style. He was so captivating. Suddenly you could really see how media was shifting. We'd moved from broadcasting at the audience to interaction 
and understanding what it was you wanted to hear about and really feeding that back into the shows and stuff. But it, it was a cool place to work. And um, I quite liked, people often say to me, you know, isn't it, you know, it's a pretty tough place to work, Sky, it's harshly commercial and a bit cutthroat. And I think a little bit of that might have been true and might be true, but there's something very, um, very transparent about that, I think. You know, you sort of say, this is what I'm going to do. And as long as you go away and deliver it, actually, everyone's pretty cool with, with what you get up to. Um, and so this was a fun place to work. And the only reason I left was because it was before that first real sort of boom and hiatus. And we were such a tiny community of sort of entrepreneurs in the UK. I mean, we all knew each other and still know each other. And, you know, VCs were sort of popping up and I, I'd get those calls saying, you know, if I gave you two million quid, what could you do with it? And I was thinking, well, I, I don't know. I actually have no idea what I could do with it. But my husband and I were sailing. We met at university when we were 19. And uh, so we'd sort of grown up, you know, and gone into the industry together. He worked in advertising. And we were sailing with some friends in Australia. And we'd just moved house. And it was horrible, as it always is. And because uh, I'd kind of grown up in New York, I was, you know, I've got lots of family in the States. And I was really quite fascinated by the, uh, what was happening in the US, all of these kind of, you know, moving websites springing up and lots of for sale by owner stuff happening. And so we wrote a real back of a fag packet business plan and said, well, actually, we could fix this. We could do some really interesting things here. We could help people to move with the property database. We could even perhaps, you know, disrupt the market and do for sale by owner. Much harder to do here than in the US, I will tell you. Um, and, you know, you could put all those moving services around it, all the money stuff, the, you know, mortgage broking, the removals, all the things are the biggest pain in the neck um, from a consumer perspective. And so we created this cutting edge, I hope you'll agree, uh, website. I was looking at this yesterday thinking, that is dreadful. I mean, that is truly shocking, isn't it? But at the time, I mean, it was absolutely regarded as, I mean, groundbreaking. And I mean, this was quite a stir at the time as well. This was like, wow, you know, advertising in this kind of size. I mean, God, you know, extraordinary. And thank God the market moves on. But this was smooth, smart move which um, I quit my job at Sky. And actually, I, it was quite a well-paid job at Sky. I had quite a nice sort of corner office. And I used to, when I flew around, you know, the world selling programming to all sorts of different people, which was how we made most of our money, you know, you got flown first class. And, you know, cars kept showing up when I was places to take me elsewhere. And uh, these VCs who'd given us money, they gave us a couple of million quid to, to do something. Um, said, no, no, you will need to quit your job, Nancy. You can't just float in occasionally to advise on this. So I, I quit all of that. And I started work properly um, on the day that the front page of the Times said, boo who on the front. And the market was collapsing. And it was pretty bloody hard. In fact, it was, you know, it was pretty tough every day. Um, but we started building the business. I mean, this is a time when, you know, we needed to have a couple of million quid because you had to spend, you know, half a million quid with some microsystems and half a million quid on Oracle licenses, you know, just to get yourself going. There was no, you know, quick, agile development. This was serious, you know, head down and then big bang territory. And um, we did that. And we were very fortunate, actually, that the market continued to deteriorate. I knew that I needed to raise a ton more money to make this work and that that just was not going to happen. And you suddenly start realizing that you have enormous responsibilities, the people working for you. I mean, I guess, you know, wow, what was I? I guess I was 28 or so at the time, 29 maybe. Um, I became very obsessed with, yeah, everyone's personal circumstances working for me. And my God, you know, I needed to just keep remortgaging our house so we could make sure everyone was okay. And, we were very fortunate that we sold this business only 11 months after we started it to what was then CGNU before it became Norwich Union and, and you know, eventually Aviva. And the reason they bought us was not because we built something brilliant. I mean, I think there were 50, 50 60,000 people using this service, um, but it was because we had people, we had talent. They were trying to develop a property portal. They were trying to get something off the ground. And you know, they were spending 1,500 pounds a day with McKinsey you know, 40 times over, but 40 guys in the office doing day jobs, each being paid 1,500 quid, you know, day rate. And 
they'd spent about three and a half million quid with Clifford Chance on getting the commercial contracts up and running. And so they didn't really want, I mean, the technology was kind of helpful that we had. You could bring that across. But really, they wanted us. And there were about 15 of us. And so we went into that business and we created ultimately what was Asserta. We bought Property Finder. And that, of course, now is merged over to be the Zoopla business. But that was a fun foray. But it was uh, a very interesting learning experience about timing and how that could go badly wrong, um, about execution and about having to be quite fleet of foot, actually, and think, OK, so how do, how do I navigate around this? But it didn't put me off. Um, I did go straight on to handbag.com, which really is my baby. Um, and, uh, and this was really cool. An another business that looked shocking, actually, at the start, but did get progressively better, although that, that was it after my time. And handbag.com became the number one fashion and beauty website in the UK. Um, before I sold it to Hearst Corporation in 2006, we had one and a half million women every month using the website. This is before Twitter and Facebook took over our lives. And we had 400,000 of those women very actively in our discussion groups talking about all sorts of different things, um, which was fascinating, really fascinating. You could genuinely glean extraordinary insights to help inform what content we were going to create. And handbag.com did not sell handbags. By the way, people always get a bit confused about that. It was the vogue of the online world. I decided that you know, I'd kind of done it on a shoestring at Condé Nast, and now I wanted to do it with some money to create something that was you know, really substantial. And we had two extraordinary strategic investors, the Telegraph and Boots, the Telegraph when Conrad Black was there. Um, and we did some great stuff. It was really interesting. And um, we did that for five years, or I did that for five years before selling that business uh, pretty successfully to Hearst. And uh, I stayed for about 15 months. Having, uh, having sold it. I probably shouldn't have stayed that long because it is tough selling your business to a big sort of corporate acquirer. I didn't have an earn out. They paid 25 million cash for the business up front. Um, I had a six month notice period. So I could have gone, but I wasn't really emotionally ready to let it go, if I'm honest. I'd had my two daughters whilst I uh, was running this business and creating it and, you know, mad. I mean, like, you know, four weeks off work, you know, then back to work and all that kind of mad stuff. And this was kind of my third baby. I wasn't quite ready to give it up. And um, actually sitting in a, a more corporate environment um, can, you know, actually, I think, you know, it was a good opportunity for me to help integrate the business and to, to get to that point where I was ready to do something again. You know, I, it was great fun launching some of the other titles, Cosmo Online and Good Housekeeping, some power brands. But I did feel a little bit like it was Groundhog Day. I'd kind of done that at Condé Nast. And um, so I moved on after 15 months. I spent 18 months doing a completely mad job. I was running a business called Video Jug for two crazy entrepreneurs. Um, I spent every third week in LA. I spent far too much time over Skype saying goodnight to my children. But I did make 75,000 short form videos um, about how to do everything, you know, from how to make chicken tikka masala, how to, you know, lay tiles in a bathroom, how to get out of a car without showing your knickers, how to perfect your golf swing. I mean, everything you can think of, because these crazy guys uh, had raised a ton of money. I mean, a serious amount of money, 15 million quid off of you know, the back of an envelope. And uh, with a huge valuation sitting on this business, we spent a lot of money creating original content. It was great fun. I could see the opportunity with evergreen content. For me personally, it was quite hard running around the globe with two small kids. But also 2008, nine came along. The market once again was not looking quite so rosy. And I had been brought in very much as that kind of you know, global CEO who was there to IPO this business or sell it for a, a really very large number to a strategic investor. I spent a lot of my sort of year and a half or so with the business talking to the president of Discovery Networks. And I thought, you know what, this thing's never going to fly. And when people say to you, you know, be careful of valuations on your business, really do. I mean, I really lived that millstone around my neck thinking, how do we ever make sense of this? I mean, how? You know, you, how do you apply the revenue to this to actually catch up with a massive inflated valuation. So I, I, I think there's a real lesson in that. You know, there's probably you know, a day or two of, wow, look what I did. You know, I built something from scratch. Look at its value already. But it is, it is a really hard one to deal with. And 
I slightly left that licking my wounds, actually, thinking, bloody hell, that's all too hard. And the Barclay family, who by then owned The Telegraph and had ended up being my largest shareholder at Hamburg.com before we sold it, um, had, had always kept in touch with me. I wasn't allowed to work for them for year, a year after I left as part of the you know, sale agreement to make sure we didn't go do it again. But they said, you know, come help at The Telegraph, which I, 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 I cannot imagine a circumstance where I'd have gone and worked for a you know, bloody great big traditional media company, particularly, you know, a newspaper business where, you know, everyone in the room, frankly, was going to be male, heterosexual, 40 or 50 something and wearing a grey suit. And I clearly wasn't. Um, but I went and did it and it was great fun for a couple of years. Did some really cool things, learned a lot of surprising things, um, surprising things about how important data is. Um, and, you know, to give you an example of that, when I first arrived, I was really asking you know, a lot of questions. They'd done a lot around digital transformation, but they didn't seem to understand a lot about their KPIs. You know, who was using it, really, and, and how were they using it, and, and what for, and what's the relationship with the consumer? And you know, when I talked to people about you know, what is it now, Telegraph Media Group, this cross-platform you know, cross thing, people would still say, well, it's a newspaper that's kind of becoming multi-platform. And ultimately, you know, that's very limiting because a newspaper is, you know, one physical product. And so I was constantly trying to challenge and think about, well, what's the relationship? You know, what, what's the Telegraph all about? You know, yeah, it is a newspaper. It's news, but also <coughs> it's about opinion. It's advice. It's entertainment. It's information. So how do we take those kind of pillars and start creating products that are a bit more relevant, you know, in a, in a digital age? And we did some great things with that, from you know, iPad apps to a gazillion other vertical apps. But one of the things I was most proud of at The Telegraph, that I'm sure you know, the board and all of my fellow sort of, you know, exec colleagues thought I was being very girly and you know, frankly a bit niche and parochial, was I looked at the data when I arrived. And we had a website with about 7 million unique users. By the time I left, there were 50 million. But 7 million at the start of my two-year stint as an executive. And when I started really understanding and digging and digging and digging, I found that actually the channel that really got loads of usage was, was the fashion channel. It wasn't news. It wasn't sports. They were really big. But the one that really had loyalty and lots and lots of interaction, and really importantly, the one that was giving money back to the ad agencies every month because we didn't have enough inventory, was fashion. And I thought, well, what is this all about? You know, actually, when you started looking at it, you know, across the entire estate, we had some amazing sort of power brands. We had Hillary Alexander, you know, household name, you know, writing for the paper. We had actually 24 fashion sort of experts on staff. We had Stella magazine, the Telegraph, you know, magazine on Saturday. We had, you know, Mario Testino shooting stuff for us. We had all these incredible assets that hadn't really been verticalized and presented in a way that enabled them to compete with the likes of Vogue and, and all of those other players in the space. The fashion channel looked just like the news channel when I arrived and just like the sport channel, you know, with tiny little pictures, which isn't the way that you consume fashion. And so whilst I think that probably my boss and my colleagues thought I was a little insane and I was off on a fairly frivolous uh, project, we made millions out of this. I mean, in a really immediate uh, way as well. Suddenly, um, we had, well, initially, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of revenue that we just didn't have before. And we had new advertisers that were coming into all areas of the brand, the magazine, as well as online. You know, the first time we saw Tiffany advertising in Gucci and Burberry, just because we created this experience that felt really, you know, relevant and appropriate. And that was kind of cool. Um, I enjoyed doing that. I also realized that, you know, I, I don't work in a corporate world. Um, I'm far too impatient now, having had my own business. I, I, I really like the sort of, you know, tripping, and I sit on the board of Tele City Group, one of the FTSE 250s, and I love doing that. I absolutely love it. I love sort of jumping in, being creative. I figured out I can deal with the corporate governance side of things. Bureaucracy is a pain in the ass, but you can sort of manage around it. But I figured out with myself that I'm not a very good corporate citizen. Um, I'm far, you know, I don't have enough patience. Um, I don't really, you know, have the appetite to play the politics that, you know, that ultimately exists. And I just want to, you know, I want that satisfaction. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's my roots in magazines. I love the fact that every month the magazine was published. There was that great masthead at the front where your name was on it and you could sort of say, there you go, that's what I did. 
And this is, for me, the digital world's a bit the same. You know, being able to be genuinely agile and see things develop is incredibly satisfying, I think. So, so I stayed for another two years in, as an advisor at The Telegraph, and I did some M&A for them, which was fun. And, and I also went off and did some, some consulting and some building of what is now my latest passion. But this was one mad final project that I got involved in. I was the launch CEO for a joint venture between the uh, UK's three largest mobile network operators for a year whilst I was trying to develop my showcase. I didn't sleep very much for that year and um, it was absolutely exhausting getting it up and running. But it was a really interesting opportunity to, to actually take on a fairly big challenge. You know, these, uh, these three brands here wanted to bring together a joint venture. That's 80% of the UK mobile marketplace. And I needed to get that cleared by the European Commission to be able to go to market which was no mean feat. Honestly, I placed my chances at no more than 50% of doing that when I started consulting for these guys. I think there was quite a lot of luck involved in that and just sheer tenacity on some of the team's part. You know, we were describing technical specs and commercial specs that I mean, we had no idea how it was going to work. We were just, you know, we were making it up. Um, we were imagining it um, as we went along in, in you know, a way that could be justified, but we were imagining these things. But there was some fun in that. I mean, again, I learned that you know it was very intellectually stimulating putting the shareholders' agreement together for this. It was um, it was fascinating dealing with some of the players involved. But again, I found myself in a corporate environment. I always knew it was a short-term thing, whilst I was um, building my showcase. That this is quite a well-paid thing, whereas the other thing is is not. <laughs> As you start your own business, it, it only costs you money. Um, uh, so so it was fun, but. Bloody hell did I learn that joint ventures are hard, especially when there are three competitors in the room. There is no easy way around it. You can be really easily drawn in by the idea that, wow, it's 80% of the market. Look what a head start I've got. And I'm sure you know some people in the room would say, you can do this much faster with much less money. You don't necessarily need all of that. And so fascinating to look at the payment space, to look at um, you know, messaging, to look at loyalty, to look at so many different areas. But it really was a bit of a uh, Machiavellian, you know, the end justifies the means. Um, it paid for the first year of developing this, which is, um, which is my new passion. Um, I absolutely love it because it's, it is a mission. And I think you kind of have to be on a bit of a mission when you're building different businesses. And this is my latest one. As I said, it's called My Showcase. Think Avon meets Space NK, so direct sales, multi-level marketing, but multi-brand, which I think is quite interesting because there's a sustainable element of that and there's an appeal to that, I think, which a single brand really struggles to actually achieve. And it's something I've been working on with a great, great group of people. And it's something I feel so strongly about. Maybe it's because I'm 43 now. I'm no longer the youngest person in the room. So I feel that now I'm allowed to actually say, I don't want to work with anyone who I don't really like and really respect and think is brilliant. Um, that's my new rule for myself, is you know, that, that criteria is, is now uh, you know, non-negotiable. So these are the people I work with. Kate, I mentioned earlier. Olivier um, over here, uh, our charming Frenchman. Olivier was the uh, uh, tech lead that built Ocado. He built the Ocado technology and he ran tech there for seven years. So he, he, he knows quite a lot about e-commerce and creating world-class uh, tech platform. Our platform is built from scratch. Um, it is world-class technology. But also, when you're doing that Avon model, you have to be able to run businesses for people. You have to be able to run businesses so that someone can become part of your community and can understand how much money they earn and how much money their team earn. They have to be able to get trained and... They have to be able to look at data layers to understand what am I going to buy for my kit today and so much other stuff. And we also schedule showcases, we call them, pop-up shops in people's kitchens all over the UK every day. So he's built some amazing tech, um, which I'm really proud of. Um, Rodrigo, our mad Brazilian, we're quite multicultural actually in, in our funny little office down in near Imperial Wharf, um, is an extraordinarily smart, talented analyst who worked for many years at Booz & Co., um, and since became kind of a chief product officer, you know, for the last 10 years or so with lots of very cool uh, digital businesses. So they're extraordinarily talented. You know, I love working with them every single day. Um, 
and I think that's amazing, actually. You know, every day I go to work, I, I haven't paid myself yet for three years. Um, now I'm pretty lucky that you know I made some money along the way, so I don't have to worry about that, and I can consult and do the odd non-exec or whatever. But it's the most fun job I ever had. I absolutely love it. I mean, it was only in October of last year that we actually set up an office. And it, it's very modest still. It's 2,000 square feet. And that's where we run a warehouse. And we have our offices crammed in there. Um, but until then, we were running it from 1,000 square foot in the basement of my house. Um, because I think that even if you are in a position where you can raise the money or you can put the money in yourself, I feel really strongly that bootstrapping a business is really important. Because I think it forces really good practice. I think you have to do things until it's so painful that you can't do it anymore. And then you find a new way of dealing with things. I mean, when I was consulting at Weave, some days I'd come home and uh, actually the warehouse had all got a bit busy during the day because suddenly you know, we had stylists up and running, doing showcases, selling orders. We, we, we hold all stock centrally. Stylists don't hold stock. We're quite like Netta Porto when we send orders out. Beautifully packaged, lots of white paper, ribbons, all that kind of business. I'm quite particular about that. And I'd get home at 9 o'clock at night having, I don't know, just you know, taken someone like Sorrel out for a drink or whatever it is. And, and there would still be 70 orders. And the team would be packing, and you think, OK, fine, right, jeans on, start packing. You know, and, and I think that is actually all part of the experience. I mean, even now, we're only two years into our journey, we've already begun laughing about the do you remember when stories, and we're still at the absolute start of this. Um, so I think, you know, work with people you really like, that you really are willing to experience some pain with, and, um, and I think bootstrapping is key. I talked about a mission. This is a really boring slide with loads of uh, writing on it. Um, when people are kind enough to write about us, the likes of Vogue, The Telegraph, The Times, they talk about us as this new concept in beauty retail. And, and that's what gets people excited. The idea that it's very accessible, you can go to someone's house, you can touch and feel a whole load of products. The 25 brands we work with are chosen by Kate. They're not widely available on the high street. Um, and they work exclusively with us with direct sales. But actually, what we really are, I talked about our technology as a platform, is we're really on a mission to enable hundreds of thousands of women to launch flexible businesses, initially in the UK, but around the world. And what do I mean by that? When I was at Handbag, I mentioned earlier that there were 400,000 women every month in our discussion groups. And they used to talk about fascinating stuff. They talked about where do I get the best mascara for defining my, my lashes. They talked about where do I get that great dress that Jennifer Aniston was wearing on Friends last night. But they also talked really extensively about I want to start my own business. But I'm finding it really hard to raise money. I'm finding it really hard to kind of get the business plan together and just tip it over the edge. And they talked about wanting to work more flexibly generally. And actually, we ran a program for five years at Handbag called Women in Business, not very imaginative, but Barclays Bank sponsored it. And they gave us incentivized small business loans where we could ask our readers to send in their plans. We had, on average, 4,000 submissions every year. We had a panel of fantastic female entrepreneurs that would then judge those submissions. And it was everything from you know, manufacturing steel in you know, Huddersfield right through to creating skincare brands and launching local childcare services. But what I discovered was in the UK every year, there are 100,000 businesses that are conceived by women that never get off the ground. And that, for me, seemed like a really alarming statistic. It felt like there was just a huge amount of talent out there that wanted to create interesting things, often a lot of talent that, because a lot of these women were aged between, I guess, you know, 25 and you know, 50, having kids, juggling, trying to find more flexible ways to fit in family, and, and not just family, other great passions that they had. But there was no capability gap for this talent base. There was just some kind of confidence gap. They were finding it hard to raise money. Stereotypically, we are less likely to have been the CEO or the finance director. There somehow was a bit less confidence around just taking a risk, just going for it. What's the worst thing that could happen? You know, you might fail. So, so what? Um, but that was not the feeling that was within this community. And so that is the thing that really inspired me to do this. I happened to have sat 
on the, the beauty industry trade board for 17 years. So I get to see a lot of what's going on in the industry. Um, there's huge innovation in the industry. 40% of all the patents applied for in Europe relate to health and beauty. This is a 17 billion pound market in the UK and only three and a half percent of it's online. So I think there's many other things, dynamics that you're looking for as an entrepreneur. There's lots of se things you're trying to sense check, but this is a really vital one for me. You need to find a wrapping that is appealing to the consumer, that's appealing to the trade, appealing to whoever it is. But I am so on a mission to help and to empower all of these women. You know, when I'm occasionally at the school gates, um, I'm not always the one who's at the school gates because I've always been doing mad things and, and traveling all over the place. But, you know, my kids are there and I get to meet all of these really cool mums. And some of them, you know, haven't worked for like nine years. You know, my, my great friend is the ex-global PR director of Gucci. And she says to me, God, I'd, I'd love to work, but I just don't quite know how to get into it. And these are, you know, of course, it, people in a privileged position. They've husbands working in the city. They don't have to do that. They're probably, you know, some of the most educated women I've met. They've decided to take a step back because they're fin financially able to do so. There's all sorts of links here. I could go on for hours about issues around leadership, what I think of Lean In, Sandberg, all of those things. But... I genuinely feel like there is a massive issue where you know, women need more contemporary ways to work. And, and we're not talking about the kind of portfolio that I operate. You know, less than 7% of the non-execs on you know, the FTSE 250 are women. We're talking about a portfolio career that's incredibly contemporary. You know, something like, I work every Wednesday afternoon in the local estate agent. I juggle dropping the kids off at school in the morning. I've got a friend who's got a pashmina business. I do her PR on a Thursday. I mean, that's the kind of contemporary career that I think is quite interesting. And now I'm also my showcase stylist. You know what? Now I run my own beauty business. I'm getting all the training, the tech, all of the things I need. And so I am on a complete mission to uh, take this all over the UK. It's the start. We're starting to see things really scale. We launched, I almost killed the team, actually. In fact, maybe the other way around, they almost killed me. We launched uh, in France, a tiny little beta in the south of France before Christmas, just to see if we could actually take it into another market without falling over. We did almost fall over, but we can, it turns out, take it somewhere else. So we'll organically let that bubble for a while. But I'm really serious about this business. In my mind, this is a billion-dollar play. This is multi-market. And, um, yeah, this is the next 10 years. I'm, you know, I'm really... So it's something that's, if not more. I'm not going to tell you more about how it works because I'm rabbiting on for far too long. One final point I would say is, I think when you're inventing things, I think you need to really think about the category that you live in. One of the things that I think is quite exciting about this business, apart from the fact that you know, I'm on a mission and I'm using all sorts of different you know, experiences along the way, is we're kind of creating this, this genuinely new category of social shopping where you know, one of the most important things at our showcases is women talking to each other, saying, oh my God, you look amazing in that lipstick. You should so buy that or do not buy that fake tan. It's just not the right color. And there's this real integrity, honesty. You know, on average, our showcases that are two hours, they gross 500 quid from maybe six women showing up. Our basket size is 95 pounds compared to Avon, nine. Um, it's, it's quite a compelling mix, I think, in terms of how this works. Um, but I think thinking about where you live, you know, what category do you occupy? How do you differentiate the whole time since it is so much easier now to get to market? You no longer need the Sun Microsystems and the Oracle license. We can all have a crack at this. Is how do you really stand out? And, and how do you create that IP? And how do you create enough collateral so you can then, then scale something? I mean, I, I definitely found out to my, you know, huge... Um, benefit recently that you know creating an online training academy does save me from driving to Grimsby most Sundays to go and train you know three women it's a bloody long way to go and do that face to face creating the IP looking at the category is really key I talked about the market I talked a little bit earlier about kind of lean and agile talked a little bit about you know a business in my basement um, thank god it's not there now I don't think I'm going to be divorced um, and drive him completely crazy with that but I think being genuinely agile, people talk about this so much. And it's one of those things that's kind of easy to talk about. It's easy to talk about being lean and agile. It's easy to talk about working in sprints and you know, how it all comes together. But 
it's quite hard to actually pull off, especially a business like this. It's quite complex. I mean, we publish magazines. You have to have a, you know, have a full range of products in that because you can't schlep around with the 800 you know, different units that we sell. You've got to create a lot of technology. I mean, really a lot of technology to run different types of businesses. And you've got to create you know, a lot of, you've got to get a lot of people on board to actually run these businesses, to have proper national coverage. But you can't do that at the start. And so finding out what truly is the minimum viable product of quality that you can take to the market. And, and I figured out you could do it with six people, six stylists, and run that and really learn a lot. And, and I think that um, I am a massive exponent of being able to do that. So I'm going to shut up in a minute. Um, I think I would summarise saying, you know, take some risks. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a bunch of things that have kind of not necessarily gone to plan. And, and nothing that bad has happened, you know, to me over the last 20 years. I've learned a huge amount from those things. And um, I think, you know, it is talked about extensively. I'm sure, you know, here at LBS, you guys talk about culture of failure and how different that is in the Valley versus here. It's, it's such a, a real thing. And, and I find, you know, in my, my team and, and even in bigger businesses when I'm advising, and how do you create that culture where people are, are willing to try things, bubble up ideas? Not every good idea does come from the founder or the people closest to them. How do you get everyone excited and contributing and participating? Very hard to do in a big corporate environment, but very possible, I think. Um, get on a mission. I think it helps particularly with one thing. It helps with clarity of your vision. You know, I never forget what it is I'm trying to do. You can sometimes get a bit, you know, a bit confused, I think, with, with, with a new business because there are no rules and so you're inventing the whole time. You've got to have some fun along the way. This is why this is Kate and I. In fact, there was a huge feature, The Telegraph, were, were so kind to um, publish about us and they took all sorts of quite serious pictures of us in all sorts of different poses. And this is the really big picture that they published on a double page spread. And uh, when I first opened it, I thought, oh, my God, that is horrific. <laughs> and then as I thought about it, I thought, you know what? That is brilliant, actually, because it was us genuinely, like, just laughing our heads off. I don't know what had just happened as part of this shoot. We're still in my kitchen, and I can't remember which photographer they had there. But I think there's something you've got to have fun. You've got to have fun with what you're doing. You know, it's bloody hard creating businesses. And uh, I mean, I'm clearly, you know, slightly mad and addicted to it, you know, third time around. But it is quite hard. Find great people to do it with and then be really persistent. I mean, relentlessly so, because, you know, every day there's going to be stuff. I'm sure, you know, many of you entrepreneurs in the room have found that already. There's going to be stuff that you think, really? Oh, my God, maybe I got this all wrong. You know, it's not going to work out. But um, I think oftentimes it can. So thank you. What um, intrigues me, you use the word invent, yeah. and, and it seems to me as if you uh, invent a new space, but you're just as keen to use a whole load of new technology at, yeah. at, at the same time, which is, I mean, which, which drives you that we could use this for this, or we're going to do this and we've got to use that? I don't know what really, really drives you. I mean, I think in this particular space, what really drives me, I mean, I spent, you know, all morning today training stylists, um, you know, sitting in a room talking about leadership, doing module two in a leadership program with, you know, a, a really eclectic bunch of women. And what drives me around this is, you know, I love the technology and I love all of that. I love kind of, you know, slightly geeking out with, you know, Olivier and Rodrigo. I mean, you know, they clearly think I am not in the same league of discussion as they are, and they're probably right, although please don't film that part. Um, but so I do love all of that stuff. I love seeing, you know, the creation of something that I can see is quite powerful that you, you could scale. But what I like is the, I like the impact it has on Sally you know, who lives in Wandsworth, who says to me, you know, this is the most important thing she's done, you know, outside of having her two children and marrying a really charming, you know, husband. This is, the, this is fantastic. This is kind of really, you know, an important thing in her life. This gives her, you know, loads of, you know, great avenues to actually explore these extraordinary skills that she's got. She's just an incredibly, 
you know, an amazingly compelling individual. And I love it when you sit there and you hear that, you know, the difference that it's making to, you know, one, one woman day to day. Questions? I should have said I was going to ask one question while you thought up others. I forgot to say that. To <coughs> the uh, can you wait for the microphone? Because it's just as valuable that we catch what you're going to say. Uh, thank you for sharing a really inspiring story. That's so impressive. Um, I wonder if will you be able to share anything about your ambitions in the developing world with this? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, India is very much kind of, you know, on our radar. Um, many developing markets, actually. We're, we're far too small to really be able to take that step at this moment in time. But we do think about it. You know, we are ambitious about it. I mean, when you think about, you know, thinking about India specifically, you think about, you know, a growing middle class. You think about the growing emancipation of women in the developing world. You think about, you know, requiring that flexibility of working. I mean, there's many, many factors that makes it very, very appealing for us to be in those markets. And, you know, also, I clearly believe that, you know, the Western world is not the place where, you know, all of the exciting, you know, econ economical advancements are going to be made. So I would love to have a foothold, notwithstanding the fact it's really very difficult to take beauty brands into markets like China. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult. It's punishing some of the regulation that sits in that market at the moment by brand, the different, you know, sort of approvals you have to do, take to get into that market. Some of our brands wouldn't even countenance it. You have got to test your products in their entirety on animals. You know, there's things that make it very, very difficult to go into that market. But I, you know, I'm serious about it. But knowing how big it is, I think you've also got to be ambitious, but also actually deliver some stuff and right now I know that you know I've got to find 500 women in the UK that you know are mad enough to come on board and do this with us and so you can think about all of that but until I've really cracked that you know 500 in its entirety you know we're making good progress but you know it was only you know less than a year ago I had six so you know I think you've got to balance your ambitions around that I'd love to be there though love to okay another one up here yeah uh, Nancy thanks yeah. for sharing the story um I, I remember when Blue.com fell over. Yep. And um, the question I have is, um, is it possible to be so ahead of the curve that you fall off the edge? Yeah, I think it is. I, I think it. I think it is. I mean, I, I remember being at, at when I was at Condé Nast. You know, some of the shows we made for Microsoft. I mean, they were really cutting edge. You know, a show for guys, a show for. And I remember Steve Ballmer, he wasn't running it at the time, but I remember one of the most exciting days I had in sort of Vogue House was I got an email from Ballmer and it just said, you guys rock, that was it, dot, dot, dot. And I thought, oh my God, you know, we've cracked it. But these shows, I mean, they only really worked when they were cashed a million times over, running in our office on, you know, a T1 line, as opposed to consumers actually trying to interact with this stuff. And of course, it didn't really work because we didn't have broadband behind us. You know, the infrastructure wasn't there. So I do think you can be so cutting edge that you can fall off the edge. I think you can be ahead of the curve. I think in many ways, what we were doing with Smooth was ahead of its time. I still think that for sale by owner is a really interesting proposition. You know, we all have a real issue with our estate agents. We think there's not much value there. And actually, why can't we do this ourselves? Why can't we sell our own houses and create marketplaces and networks and all the rest of it? It's like 10% of the market in the US, not quite 10%, just sub 10%. So I think there are things that are so cutting edge. You know, timing is everything, you know, a bit of luck, a fair wind. Um, so I think you can be too cutting edge sometimes. Doesn't mean you can't come back to that idea. Well, up to the top. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Hello. That was great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you just you touched on the lean thinking at the end, uh, and you mentioned minimum viable products, and then you dropped in two words of quality. Yeah. I just wondered what advice, because I think for some entrepreneurs that could be a little bit of a contradiction. Yeah. Uh, and I just wondered what advice you've got on MVP of quality. Yeah. I think of quality does not mean Rolls Royce. So of quality means something that actually is usable, um, that can be you know, meaningful in terms of learning something and giving you the insights then to start iterating. And you know, one of the things that I was really strict about when we were starting out was we, we agreed that 
you know, we could probably have six stylists who would be out there just demonstrating whether this appeal had concept, had, had you know, any, a, any appeal, this concept had appeal. And one of the things that we discussed a lot was whether I should be one of the stylists. And of course, I thought I should, and the rest of the team thought I shouldn't. Um, and the reason I wanted to do it was because I felt really strongly that I needed to be in people's kitchens. I needed to be there. I needed to try and take payments for things. I needed to truly understand how it all worked. Um, otherwise, I didn't really have much credibility around it. And so, you know, the payment system that we had was very rudimentary. But I could operate that, and I could train five other women how to operate that. You would not have wanted too many consumers using that directly on the site. Um, so I, th I think it's about enough quality so that then I could be phoning Olivier and Skyping you know, with the two of them at sort of you know, one in the morning once I'd got home, saying, well, this bloody didn't work, and then this happened, and would you believe it? You know, how about this? We hadn't thought about this at all. So I, it's not about you know, finessing the whole thing. I mean, we couldn't create a magazine to start off with. Um, now we create that twice a year. It's glossy. It's you know, amazingly edited by Kate. Instead, we had six pieces of paper, which I was appalled by at the time, you know, all the time. And yet I was the big exponent saying, that's it. I'm, we're not paying for a magazine right now. It's madness. So I think you have to boil it down. It's not slick, but it is enough quality to learn something. Um, if it's too, you know, clunky, uh, you can, of course, put something in market where people think, well, that's not going to work. That's not great. You've got to tr somehow create the, the, the kernels of the experience is my take. Okay. Fine line, though. It's judgment call. One of the back there. Yes. Uh, yeah, when you uh, first started creating handbag.com, were you uh, inspired by what you thought was missing from the other major like, uh, players at the time? Was it something you just wanted to do? Or, um... Um, actually, handbag.com had launched before I became the founder of it. It was launched by Boots and uh, The Telegraph. And they launched it to kind of learn about a bunch of things. They thought they could sell um, an ISP service. So they work with BT infrastructure to sell, you know, actually, you know, an ISP service. So you could get dial-up um, to the internet, and you could get an at handbag.com email address, which was pretty attractive at the time. Not that exciting now. Um, they were won wondering how e-commerce would work online. I mean, so they had all these little um, tiny uh, businesses, largely sex shops, in actual fact, that were paying little tenancies to be online, and then a little bit of advertising which was outsourced to, I think, 24-7 just before they crashed uh, the first time round. And um, so <coughs> they'd had a year of sort of launching a brand, and I knew Steve Russell, the then CEO at Boots, and I knew um, Dan Colson, the CEO at The Telegraph from my days at Condé Nast, and they approached me and said, look, we've trialled these things, but it's not one thing or another. But we think you could become the founder, and we'll give you a decent piece of the business, but you've got to come up with a plan for it. And I was sort of going through, you know, I did have an eight-month uh, earnout um, at Smooth into uh, Norwich Union, and I was thinking, I actually thought they were a bit mad to start off with, and I slightly felt that it was a bit patronising, if I'm really honest. I thought, why do we need something for women, specifically? I mean, why am I not going to read the FT or, you know, whatever else is out there? It felt a bit strange. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought... Actually, this is, this is a media play here. This is a great brand, actually. And we could really go in there and we could create a real point of view around fashion and beauty. And we could also write on subjects like health and relationships and, and all sorts of other things. So, so I did sort of see a gap in the market, ultimately. And I guess based on my previous experience at Condé Nast, I thought, you know, I'd actually like to do this with, with a bit more investment to really go after it. Um, but to start off with, it was just... Yeah, it was an opportunity that was presented to me that I was a little bit cynical about. Um, and, uh, yeah, but it, it, it was amazing. I loved, loved doing it. And there clearly was a huge demand for it because, you know, suddenly one and a half million women consistently every month, you know, over five years. It, it was amazing. They, looking at 30 million pages, I mean, it was obviously with much less uh, competition. Now you'd be very hard pushed to create something of that kind of, you know, scale. Um, but, you know, it, it was fun. I think there really was a demand for it. Okay, another, one, another and yep. two questions. Here. Cool. My question is in re relation to your selling of the businesses. How did you know when to sell, and did they approach you, or how did you go about doing this? Because based upon what you yep. said, you did not have a good understanding of mergers and acquisitions, I suppose, or selling businesses, generally mm. speaking. Yep. So no. how did you come about 
realize that this is the time to sell? Or did they approach you or vice versa? Well, the first time around, I kind of had to. The market had crashed, and it was like, oh my god, I need to find five million quid uh, to keep this thing, you know, going and growing. And I was talking to two different funds about five million quid, both of which were in contingent on the other kind of signing up. But meanwhile, everything was getting bleaker every day, and I thought, this is not going to work. So we sold the business, we made some money. Our investors got, you know, some money out, and and it was great. But we did not make, you know, gazillions of pounds. The second time around with handbag, actually, I was um, uh, working with the Barclay family. We were about to launch the business in the US. We decided that iVillage owned the market in the US, and we should go and give them a run for their money there, because we, you know, we were the market leader here in the UK. And uh, we were just exploring that. I was spending a lot of time in New York, working with various different ad agencies, understanding how quickly we could you know, build up um, a really sizable audience there. And, um, the Barclay family had committed a, set, a really huge amount of money to going to the US. And what I was looking for was I was looking for a partner to go to the US with. And I was talking to Hearst about that. I wanted them to take 50% of the business in the US and to give us kind of a home there and access to some of the clients and, and some credibility, really. But actually, this was you know around the time that... Um, you know, lots of regulation was changing in the US. People were going to prison for things, you know. And uh, the Barclay family, I could tell, was sort of saying to me, are you sure this is all going to be all right, you know, going to the US? And, and we started to get, the market really started to pick up. And we started to get offers out of the blue, unsolicited. And by the time I got about the third offer, and Hearst had made it very clear from the start that they would love to buy the business um, because they had been slow coming to market in the UK. That um, I said to you know Aidan Barkley, well maybe we should think about that. Let's not think about these offers that I thought were there was way too much paper involved. Um, let's actually go and see you know what we could get. And so I I suggested to to Hearst, the guy who was running it here in the UK, what I thought the price was, and you know that if they could come back in 48 hours to let us know if they really were serious about it, then we'd love to look at that. And we did the deal in six weeks. So. So I kind of knew who the right buyer was for it. Um, and, and the timing, I was really torn at the time. I mean, we all did well out of the business. We all made, you know, made money out of it. But I would have quite liked to go to the US and create, at the time, I don't know, $100, $200 million business rather than selling something for you know, $25 million sterling. But it was good. You know, I learned a lot from it. And I think, yeah, it, it just kind of, everything made sense in the end, the right offer right for the investors. Uh, Nancy, thank you for sharing your story. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience in finding the right people, uh, financiers, partners, you know, what worked and what didn't? I think there's, that's um, a really tough one, actually. And I think that that has been much easier for me this time because I kind of belong to a community where, you know, I was, I, was at in, I was in Paris for a few days last week doing, I don't know if you guys know, GP Bullhound's Media Momentum Awards, which is kind of recognizing Europe's 50 fastest growing tech businesses. And, um, and I'm one of the judges for that. I have been for about 10 years. And when I was there, I, I intended to start fundraising last week for a, another round for my business. And, and it all just happened whilst I was there. You know, I kind of kicked it off there and then rather than back in London because I realized that so many of the you know, kind of the private investors, I mean, the really fantastic private angel investors and also some of the funds that I was interested in talking to, they were there and I've known them for a long time now. So you kind of have relationships and it makes it much easier. But I think, you know, the first time around, certainly with Smooth, I think it was really hard trying to find those right partners. And it's such a critical thing as well. I mean, for me, I funded this business for the first you know, year or so. Last year, I did raise some money from two private individuals. Um, and they have been amazing. And I think you have to be really clear what you want out of it. You know, These two people I know through the industry, and, um, and they feel as passionate about this business in a different way but, but, than I do. You know, one guy. You know, he, he flies in from Monaco, um, you know, on a regular basis. I largely see him for dinner or a cup of coffee. He's hugely informed about our business. We operate on the basis that our, our platform is, has a lot of KPIs baked into it. So we just give them, you know, their own logins so they can see. So we're, we're not producing management reports every month and expending our energy doing that. They can just log in and see 
what do the sales look like, how many stylists are there, what, what are the dynamics. But you know, this, this one guy, Richard, is amazing because you know, I might meet him at the arts club for dinner and I'll, I, I'm always very candid, as you've probably figured out this evening, and so I share the good and the bad and the fairly ugly. And I'd be noodling something with him over dinner about, you know, leadership programs not taking off quick enough, or I haven't got enough stylists, no one in Newcastle. And I'll get a text from him when I'm in the cab on the way home saying something like, don't get bogged down in the detail of what's happening this month or next month. Think about when you're standing on that stage in Miami talking to 10,000 women. Just think about that, and that's only a couple of years away. And that is what you need from your investor is who the hell knows if that's what we can achieve in that time frame. But you need someone who, who believes in it and is willing to back you to go and do that. And so I, I don't know what the answer is to that. How do you find the right partner? But I think you have to spend the time kind of, you know, kissing a few frogs, really talking about the business and just trying to understand if there's kind of a value match there so that you all know where you're going, you know, do you want to work with these, these people? Do they want to work with you? Do they believe in what you're doing? Because I appreciate that so much. I really do. Um, it, you know, it k k gives you that it, motivation, that momentum. We all need that sometimes. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there um, because we've overrun already. But I just Sorry. couldn't interrupt this tour de force, mm. this <laughs> complete outflowing of, of energy and enthusiasm. Mm. It would have been a crime. And, 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 and actually hugely distinctive uh, mm. in terms of the speakers we have here. Just that, that massive outflowing of energy. So, oh. Nancy, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.